You're listening to the Loving Your Own Soul podcast, and I'm your host, Britt Olson. Guided by my own intuition, my intention is to deliver genuine conversations centered around health and wellness, spirituality, self-expression, and culture. In this space, I will provide you with real-life stories, theories, and inspiring perspectives to help you uncover and tap into your own true potential. I'm so grateful you've chosen to tune in with me on this mindful exploration to living a more fluid life through a deeper connection to the soul. Now let's dive into today's journey. What's up, everybody? Hope you are all having a wonderful day, wonderful week. I cannot believe that it is July 2020. We are halfway through the month already, and this has just been such an interesting year. Um, It is truly wild to think that we are already halfway through the year. We have been in quarantine, some of us are back in quarantine, dealing with so, so much going on in our world, but today's episode is really prominent, um, talking about all different issues that we are all kind of witnessing and facing in our world. We are joined by Taylor Turner of Healing and Hindsight, and Taylor is just such a wealth of wisdom and ideas and concepts, and she really makes you think. We chat about Taylor's healing journey as she was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes at a very young age, and her just kind of journey and experience in managing her disease, what brought her to start Healing in Hindsight, which was created as a way to kind of help other diabetics like herself find information, inspiration, a little bit of encouragement, and really just kind of question question the disease and find ways for it to be reversed and not have to be on medication for the rest of your life and everything like that. She just is so inspiring, um, to be honest, and such a great energy as her work in this world is really just all about fighting for the betterment of individuals, betterment for society, ideologies, just everything involved. Um, You guys are going to love it. And I've actually split this episode into two parts. So today you have part one, and then you will find part two releasing shortly after. But in today's episode, we also even go into some of the racial discrimination issues that take place within the hospitals and the medical worlds and Taylor's experience in that. And then she relays some other um, just really shocking experiences. We go pretty open, uh, definitely very vulnerable. Taylor kind of even just openly shares the differences between myself as a white woman and herself as a black woman. And yeah, it's just awesome. I love Taylor. We have, she definitely is one of my new friends. I hope to visit her in Texas at some point because she is just such a wonderful soul entirely. And she makes you think. She calls it out. She says it like it is. And she eloquently says it like it is with the best intention, which makes her just such a cool individual. Um, But yeah, definitely stick around for part two as well. Part two, we go into a little bit more of the racial discrimination that's seen in the wellness industry with different brands, male versus female, which we touch on a little bit of that at the end of this episode. We even go into some personal um, insights to Taylor. We even talk about psychedelics at the very end and the use of those and opening up our brain capacities in addition to her relationship and just complete transparency there in how she lives her life. So super fun two-part episode. So excited for you guys to get part one of Taylor and then follow it up with part two. You are going to love it. I promise you that. If you are interested in connecting with Taylor, you can find her online at her blog, healinginhindsight.com. And then same on Instagram or Facebook at Healing and Hindsight. So yeah, I'm so excited for all of you to be here tuning in. So grateful for you as always. I so appreciate each and every one of you who choose to listen to this podcast. I do hope that it inspires you. And and as always, if you do feel inspired, definitely don't forget to pay forward the effort and do good for those in our communities. Um, With that, before we jump into today's episode, I did just want to make mention of one of my really favorite 
wellness brands and a brand that I have been incorporating into my daily lifestyle for maybe just over a year now, but that is Four Sigmatic. Four Sigmatic makes blends of different coffee mixtures, mushroom drinks, etc. They use a lot of adaptogens and really healthy vitamins and minerals and superfoods that are so necessary for our diet and just daily lifestyles here mushrooms, medicinal mushrooms. I'm actually going to do a weekly digest on them coming up here soon, but definitely check out Four Sigmatic. I love their ashwagandha coffee blend. It kind of calms you down with still giving you that caffeine edge. They have lots of different lion's mane blends, shaga mushroom. Um, Their cacao reishi blend is so, so good. It's like really just a healthy hot chocolate in a way. It's a great way if you're trying to beat those late afternoon or late night sugar cravings, just have a mug of their cacao reishi blend. It is so good. It also makes for a really great coffee alternative as well. If you blend it up, put a little bit of collagen, some cashew milk in there, and you are good to go. But definitely check out Four Sigmatic. If you are interested, check out the link that is listed in the show notes where you can get $15 off of your order. Check out Four Sigmatic. They are fantastic. Without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into this episode with Taylor Turner. Taylor, thank you so much for joining me here today. I'm so excited to have you on here. And you and I, we connected online, I think through a common Facebook group. I don't even remember. I think it was the Almost 30 Girls. Uh, yeah, we were, we're, I joined the podcast pro Facebook group and then learned that we're also in the almost 30 group. Um, so, so yeah, still a common thread. <laughs> yeah. Fun time. So well, thank you for joining us from Texas and I'm just excited to chat with you about your journey. You've certainly been through it the last couple of years, but, um, if you're comfortable, we'll go ahead and just kind of jump on into it if you want to give the listeners just a little back bit of background about who you are and what you've been dealing with the last couple of years. Yeah, I'm happy to do so. So um, like I said, my name is Taylor um, and I'm born and raised in Texas and I'm, I'm 30 now, uh, but back um, 2016, at end of 2015, going into 2016, so 25 to 26, um, I ended up finding out that I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And so it, it wasn't really a surprise more so than it was like, oh man, <laughs> because I had been uh, at least making several attempts at not getting to that point. Uh, Both of my parents are type 2 diabetics. So I was aware that it was something that could potentially come up for me. And so just the last few years has been kind of an up and down roller coaster of trying to figure out having a young professional lifestyle, uh, but still maintaining my health appropriately. And so it's definitely been very challenging uh, trying to navigate, you know, having a social life and going out. Um, and wanting to, you know, not feel left out uh, when people go to restaurants and things like that, just because I have to figure out, you know, is this going to spike my blood sugar? Did I bring my meds with me? Should I take my meds? I've been drinking, you know, all these things that can come up uh, as a young adult. And so when I was diagnosed, I kind of felt like there wasn't a community of my peers that was going through the same things or experiencing or living the same lifestyle. And so I had nowhere to really turn to anybody to be like, how do I deal with this outside of my parents? And my parents got together very young, so they didn't, you know, live, uh, you know, by themselves in their 30s or anything like that. They had me and my sister. So um, I really had zero uh, idea of like, how do I be a 25 year old with type 2 diabetes, you know? And so that's when I kind of just had this idea of like, okay, well, if it's not out there, then maybe it should be out there because I would hate for anybody else to kind of feel just completely almost like naked (laughs) you know in a way of just like I'm just out here ass naked and I don't know what to do and everybody sees me and is watching me flail around and not owning this so it was just one of those situations where like somebody's got to put something out there and I'm not one to to shy away from experimenting on things and so um, I decided to create my my own kind of little setup and it started out as a blog and it did not (laughs) I didn't do a whole lot with it it was just up and downs over the last few years, um, but it's it's kind of never gone away. I mean, obviously the, the disease itself has never gone away just yet, yet. Hopefully one day, that would be amazing. 
Yeah, yeah, that that is the goal. But I, I just kept feeling very strongly of like things were just aligning up to give me the space to really go all in with this. And so um, that's when I decided, OK, I, I think I, I've always had these great conversations with people about this. And like, you know, people are, are you know, strangely ignorant about a lot of things with diabetes and how easily um, it can slip past you. And next thing you know, you're already over that hill and now you're having to take all this medication or you're dealing with all these weird things. So I decided, dude, I talk to people about this all the time. Just record yourself talking about this versus trying to do, you know, my dad says like, don't try to do like the sniper route. Try to try to get as many people in the field as you can um, because that's making more impact. And so I decided to start my own show. Um, so that way I can share, you know, the conversations and the ideas and things that I've been dealing with in my journey so that if there's someone out there who's like, I just found out or I've been dealing this for a while, but I just don't know what to do because no one's no one's doing the same things I'm doing or at least living a similar lifestyle. And so people know, like, you're not the only person out there that's dealing with this. And, and let's kind of, you know, put our heads together and figure out not only how can we hopefully reverse or at least be able to naturally manage, but really put pressure on the systems that are in place that that kind of put us in this position. Um, quality of food, you know, the uh, idea of, of prescribing medication over nutrition, you know, things like that, that can really um, not only affect us personally, but really like change the dynamic of our society. So, yeah. Totally. Yeah, I definitely am very interested to talk to you about food and medication and just all the challenges that go into your diagnosis and other uh, diagnoses and chronic illnesses. But first, kind of leading up to actually getting diagnosed with type 2 diabetes at a young 25, which is such a rough age as well. I mean, the 20s are such just a fun time for everybody as you obviously know with your experiences, mm -hmm. but did you have any signs and symptoms leading up to it? A little bit of both. So I, I had the year before, I remember I went home to Dallas uh, where my parents are and I was having a conversation with my dad because for some reason I didn't really know that he was a type two diabetic until I just, he kept mentioning like, oh, I need to take my meds. I need to do this. Um, every time I meet him, I'm like, why is he doing that? I knew he like, he had like blood pressure stuff, other things. And then he's like, yeah, I, I take you know, metformin and stuff. I was like, I, I get you don't have to do like a family announcement on these things, but I just, just wasn't aware. I was just so used to it being my mom. Um, so I remember talking to him. I was like, how did you know? You know, like what led you to, to get to the doctor and say, I think I need to be screened for this. And so he told me like something that your body does when it has a lot of sugar in its system and it can't take it all in is it'll start to push it out in different ways. So like your eyes will water, you go to the bathroom a lot, um, your mouth will get dry. So it forces you to drink more. So you'll flesh out more. And so um, I started to experience those things. Like I was um, sleeping with a water bottle under my pillow one, cause you know, me and, and the uh, guy I was dating at the time when we were living together, we didn't have nightstands. And so uh, it was, it was kind of like a, well, if you want this water and like reaching all the way down on the floor, it's just not you know, feasible, just put it on your pillow. My mouth would get so dry and sticky, like it was unbearable. I could not sleep through the night. So I always had to go to sleep with one or two water bottles because it would wake me up out of my sleep, almost like I couldn't breathe almost. And so I would drink some water and because I'm drinking so much water, it would then in turn, I'm going to the bathroom all the time. Like I had to get a medical accommodation at work to allow me extra breaks because I was just going that much. And then my eyes were constantly watering. Like people were like, are you okay? Like and I naturally like water up anyway. So if I like, you know, yawn my eyes water anyways, but like just randomly just tear, you know? <laughs> and so then the, the final straw for me was kind of like, I started fainting. And so the first time that I fainted, uh, I was getting ready for work and I was taking a shower and I fell in the shower. And so thankfully, no, no major injury, like I had a nice little knot, but my, my, um, my ex at the time, he had to like pull me out of the shower and get me on the bed. And he was like so close to calling 911 because I wouldn't, I was like unconscious and, and it was only like two or three minutes. And I finally like woke up and I'm just like, what the hell happened? Like I was just very like foggy and sadly it happened about three more times, um, and I wasn't in the shower, thankfully, or I wasn't in a space of driving or anything like that. But that really kind of was like, okay, I need to go see a doctor about this. And, you know, my dad's voice started to creep up of like, oh, yeah, he mentioned that these kind of things happen. And I'm like, 
oh God, I hope it's not. Cause the whole year before, like we had that conversation a year before. And so I was really trying to get myself in a space to not have that happen. But I went the completely wrong, wrong route. I tried like every fad diet and all the stupid teas and all of these things. And, you know, my partner's, com- you know, at the time he's complete basketball build. So he could just eat whatever and nothing happened to him. And it's all frozen and fried. And if you want vegetables, it's going to be canned corn and green beans. That's it. You know, so my environment, although I take full responsibility that he wasn't like four spooning me these things in my mouth. Right. But even so, my environment wasn't conducive for that. And trying to adjust my eating habits while living with someone who has complete opposite and you're trying to save money. So it's just like, all right, eat the food that you have. Don't try to like cut corners because it's just going to weigh on the budget way too much. And so, um, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It is tough. Food has such a control over our life and then just the emotions and then the cravings as well, especially when going through something. I mean, I've been through it myself with weight fluctuations and I'm like, I know I shouldn't eat this, but this is just what's going to feel and taste good right now. So I'll change tomorrow. And it's, kind of that cycle yeah yeah absolutely and and it's definitely uh I'm not perfect like I definitely got a nice little bag of chocolate peanut M&Ms waiting for me um because you know I need I have to keep some on hand every now and then uh, when I know that like the girl time is coming because I just get intense classic chocolate and salty (laughs) and even though I still portion out very small I'm like I'm not going to deprive myself of this because that just means I'm going to go on a binger later and that's way worse (laughs) and so uh so yeah definitely it's it's been a a lot but yeah it was um it was a very interesting time I probably dealt with it maybe two to three months before I was like okay something's weird let me go get this checked out and so um sure enough when I went to my doctor's appointment um they do a urine test as well as a blood test and just from the urine test alone my doctor came back and was like yeah we're still going to do the blood test just to like completely make sure but there's so much sugar in your system just from the urine test so pretty sure you're 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 in the the full-blown diabetes lane and so uh blood test came back sure enough yep got my my medication and everything prescribed and headed home and had to like figure out (laughs) what I was gonna do from there and how to navigate things from there well what was that emotional experience like for you because I think it's really hard with illness especially one like diabetes where Mm -hmm. really at all stages in life I could say at our 20s but really I'm kind of under the impression that do we ever actually grow up as a society, I don't think so, but it can (laughs) be difficult when you're not physically seeing someone being sick Mm -hmm. and kind of that, Mm -hmm. like, well, you look fine and you're Mm -hmm. smiling, so you Mm -hmm. must be okay. Was there, Mm -hmm. um, just kind of a lot of like emotional trauma that went with that, with relationships and kind of everyday life? Yeah. Um, and it was slow creeping, you know, I think because I was already used to it with my parents and I started having, the, you know, that conversation um, with my dad more specifically um, a year before. I even got tested the year before and I was fine. So it kind of was just a huge wake up call of like what shifted in the last year that I'm here now. And so a, a lot of that was my weight issues. I was at my heaviest. I was, uh, you know, over 200 pounds, which I'd never been before. You know, my relationship at the time was very toxic. I couldn't see that, you know, until uh, five years later. But Um, even though we were good people, we just were not lined up, you know, for each other. And so all of that kind of just really reared its head once I had confirmation of my, my diagnosis. It was just like, okay, this thing happened. Okay. Here I am picking up these things. Okay. I'm talking to my dad on the way home of like, what can I expect with the medication and things like that? It's just like, okay. You know, kind of like a numb state for, for a little bit of, you know, you find out something and it's kind of so big, you're just really not sure how to, to wrap your head around it so you kind of just continue as normal for a bit of like is it really (laughs) you know uh but no uh and so even you know my partner at the time like I I told him and you know you know he was sweet like what can I do but it was just kind of like nothing really changed even if I shared you know eventually like later on like what can I do to help and I'm like I kind of need our food situation to shift you know I'm not saying we got to tear down everything but there's something that has to to shift here uh, and he got very defensive about that. Like, I'm not, you know, putting the, the the fork to your mouth. And I'm like, I'm not saying that you are. But if the access in the house is only this, what do you want me to do? Like, I can sit here and starve if you want me to. So even like it started just ha- 
causes tension. And then uh, I had actually had to end my contract um, with the job that I was on. I was working for a temp agency for um, Apple at the time. And my absences had just racked up, you know, so bad that um, if I didn't do anything, I was just going to get let go. Like the next instance of being, you know, really late um, or having to call in, I was going to get let go. And I just I didn't want that um, in order to be able to be eligible and stuff like that. So I had to step away from my job, you know, Um, and all of that kind of just left me sitting alone doing too much thinking because I'm an overthinker. I analyze everything and, you know, I'm just like, what do I do? I just kind of spiraled. And there was a little bit of, de- of a, you know, kind of depressive state too, of just like, I'm sure. okay, life doesn't matter, whatever. I'm going to keep drinking this crap. I'm going to keep eating this crap because, you know, who cares? Like at this point, you know, whatever. I don't, it's not that bad. I don't feel that bad, you know, um, uh, whatever. Like I'm in this relationship you know, I, I don't feel pretty. I don't feel anything. It's fine. Whatever. I, it's not like I'm out there, you know, dating or whatever. So who cares? Um, definitely like natural human behavior, I would say. Yeah. 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 Definitely just kind of a weird, um, you know, when it's something that isn't or doesn't feel like severe, like a, a, another major illness where it's going to cause a, a huge uh, physical toll on you immediately, you know, it's hard to kind of like really sit with the fact that you have this disease even though there are very very heavy consequences for keeping this unchecked um if you're not experiencing that immediately it's it's really hard it's actually you know very similar to what we're dealing with with this COVID situation very much just like that you show symptoms or you don't and and the scary part is that if you don't part and I think that's the one thing that's challenging for people is if you don't show anything, which you can still be a diabetic, even if you don't show symptoms, um, then, then why should I bother? You know, and I'm, I'm kind of like, it's just like STDs. I'm getting them checked every year. I don't care if I am with the same person because you never know and things creep up and things develop and things drop, do the whole panel because it peace of mind is way better than the unknown. And so that's the part that really trips people up. I was like, there are more cases or there, there's a lot of people and millions and millions of people who are affected by this on paper, but it's the number of those who are not on paper that freaks me out the most. And I'm like, why are people not freaking out about this? <laughs> you know what I mean? One thousand percent. Yes, it was definitely a lot, but it took a minute for it to sink in for a second, you know, especially when I like actually started taking my medication and even like the toll that that had on my body at the time, it kind of um, just amplified that, you know, I'm just like, oh, really? Like, <laughs> you know, so um, emotional roller coaster for sure. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. I think as well, you know, like giving the COVID symbolism is just a perfect example to that. And it's like, you know, mm-hmm. if I'm not throwing mm-hmm. up every hour, if I'm not on my quote unquote deathbed, like is anything mm-hmm. actually wrong with me? Mm-hmm. Hopefully we can change that mentality. But I think mm-hmm. it's, I think it's tough. And I think it's kind of a way that we've all been conditioned to be as well. But within mm-hmm. that, I mean, food was a big part for you. So I'm kind of curious to mm-hmm. understand that transition and how that was. But then also having to deal with the prescriptions and the medication and just we live in a very controlled world. Actually, mm-hmm. have you seen What the Health on Netflix? Um, I know of it, but I haven't watched it. Oh my gosh, you need to watch it. I think I watched it last week, maybe. It'll get you really, really fired up. But he basically kind of goes through the different diseases, the food industries, the control, and just everything that goes on. And actually brings up the American Diabetes situation, um, Di- American Diabetes Association, mm-hmm. and how diabetes is more than just sugar that can affect you, and it's actually processed meats and everything like you had kind of explained. But then. On the flip side, the sponsors of the American Diabetes Association are companies like Hormel, and they list recipes on there that says if you eat this turkey sandwich, it will lower your diabetes when really the processed meat is a massive contributor to that. So I'm just kind of number one, watch that for sure, because Mm -hmm. it'll light you (laughs) up. You'll get so fired up. Definitely let me know once you do, but I'm just curious kind of your opinion and experience on all that yeah um food is is something that is just 
it, it, at one point, I understand the need to evolve our food system. So it's not that I'm against uh, evolution in that. Um, I think what really kind of just makes me really just angry about it is, you know, you use the American uh, Diabetes Association, a perfect example. You're in partnership with a company that you know or can you got the money to find out, you know, what their setup is and if the food is actually of quality, like are we actually consuming or uh, hormones meat and then doing a blood sugar test just to see how levels are going. It, you literally can carry one in your pocket. You know what I mean? So it's just like my biggest kind of beef with all of that, no pun intended, uh, is, is pharmaceuticals and food industry. Because if you think about it, we don't prescribe for food. Um, uh, uh, I'll do a trade for trade. Have you seen the uh, the magic pill? No, not yet. It's on my okay. list. So that's that would be the one that I would say kind of our, our trade for trade documentary setup. Um, uh, but that one, it's more diving into uh, keto and, and kind of low carb. Um, but something really stood out to me uh, in that documentary um, because there is a uh, a doctor on there who talks about his experience being in like one of those fast clinics, you know, where you see them for 15 minutes and then, but you've been waiting for 30, <laughs> you know, and then uh, what's going on with you? Okay, this is symptom, this symptom, this symptom, this symptom, here's a pill, go about your business, right? And he talks about how frustrated that experience was because he couldn't really have conversations with people about what was leading to the symptoms. That's all that they were treating, the symptoms, not the condition. And so he ended up quitting and starting his own practice. And no matter what you have, unless you just absolutely need that medication, because everybody comes in at different stages, right? He prescribes food first. They completely break down food and nutrition first. And I feel like if that is the highlight from a doctor's perspective, also that they only spend 24 hours in their entire 55 million years of schooling on nutrition is also something that's really kind of like what <laughs> you know and so I think it's really just it's it's uh business and we have integrated business so deeply in our society where it now controls how our society goes so hey food industry listen we got we got major big science over here um we can treat a lot of the things that pop up based off of the food that you guys are putting out there because you know the FDA they're not going to shut down on every single ingredient even though our European counterparts seem to ban a lot more stuff that's not good for us and I don't know they seem to have better lifespans I don't know fact check that for me I don't know but hey if you don't want to change anything that you're doing we'll figure out the science science stuff behind it to prolong whatever's going on y'all keep pushing that just send them our way right that's what I really feel like is happening Y'all are just having one big, you know, Illuminati-esque relationship over our heads where everybody's benefiting because as long as you keep making things that are sending people back into clinics, even if you adjust the ingredients, even if like, okay, we'll tell you if there's sugar in there or not or added sugar, but we won't list the added sugar to the T of how much. We'll just say that there might be added sugar, but it's sugar free. That don't make no sense. <laughs> like how, how, how does that work? You know what I mean? So that's where I get really, really just kind of fired up because my doctor, when I got diagnosed, said, hey, we're going to start you out on metformin. It's totally common. It's usually the first thing that we go with uh, if, you know, just to see if we can get control. We don't want to start immediately on insulin because you can end up on insulin as a type 2 diabetic. Um, but we need to see how your body reacts to this, you know, get some lifestyle changes and see if this can help maintain. She's like, a lot of my patients, that's all that they need to take. Just metformin. They're fine. Back to regular scheduled program to a degree. And I was like, okay, for how long though? And she's like, oh, that, that might just be the only thing that you ever need. And I'm like, like for the rest of my life? Like, like you want me to take this for the rest of my life? Not that I don't appreciate whoever figured out metformin, right? Liver failure, kidney failure, long-term use. You know, it's, it's like when we watch those infomercials about those different, uh, uh, you know, ask your doctor about this, right? And they just list off all the things that are basically, it's like, it'll kill you if you take it long enough. And so I'm like, why is that acceptable? Why are you not telling me, I'm going to start you off on metformin and then we need to really get you into, I'd still, I had my doctor put me in whatever diabetes program that they're supposed to put you in. I was like, I'll figure it out myself. Um, but start you out on metformin. Let's get you in these programs. Let me ride your ass so that way I know that you're in these programs, right? 
let's figure out your lifestyle changes let's figure out what we need to toss out in your pantry and in your freezer and in your in your um, uh, refrigerator and then let's monitor how these changes are affecting in in uh, tandem with your uh, metformin and then the goal is to taper you off to me medication is like training wheels I have no you know, um, bad things initially to say about medication. I think it's important. I'm glad we discovered it. Clearly in the East, it's something that we were always doing. We just made it a little bit more modern, right? And so use it, but it's just like a bike with training wheels. Get to a point where you don't need them because I don't know about you. I think I'd be really weird if I saw an adult on an adult bike with training wheels. One hundred percent. I just don't know how I feel about that. And they're just like, this is how I do every day. And I'm like, how you navigate them corners like that? Like, you can't hit those sharp turns with them training wheels. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's just like, use it for what you need, just like crutches. You know, nobody is running around on crutches forever when their leg is broken. When it's healed, you get a little bit of rehab and then you walk. And I think that's how we should treat medication so we can put all of that great brain power and science into the stuff that we can't figure out for real. Your cancer, your HIV fucking COVID like you know like that's what we need to put the energy into versus stuff that is 100% preventable and or reversible through food and nobody wants to explore that heavily and if it is explored the food that we have that's cheap and readily available which is affecting lower income communities which just happens to be black and brown communities they're the ones at higher risk like it's on the CDC's website that black and Hispanic people are higher High, are more highly susceptible to type 2 diabetes than Asians and non-Hispanic whites. So it's just a whole, you know, cycle that's keeping us down. And our parents didn't know that. There's no way that our parents could prepare us for that because all they knew is I'm, I'm balling on a budget for real. This is the type of meat that I have to get. I have to get all this canned and processed stuff. They didn't know. Mm-hmm. They just followed the stupid pyramid that they put out. Nobody was challenging or questioning because who had time? They had to just work, you know, and then our grandparents, they're kind of stuck in the middle because they were actually growing and sustaining their own food, you know. But in the in the 50s and 60s, whenever, you know, all these wars are breaking out and women are doing more in the workforce, who has time? So the answer is, how can we figure out a quick fix? And I think that's kind of the turning point of like, OK, now we need to slow the quick fix down well, just a little bit. Just a little bit. We need to make sure that whatever we're doing, I feel like the 50s was a huge time where a lot of shit that could have been beneficial for us to know as a society got covered up. Because we'd rather advance our society than do it right the first time. And now we're in the process of having to do it again. And unraveling all of that takes a lot of time, energy and work. And we're unfortunately mixed with people who are willing to do the work and who really just don't care so much money invested in it as well. And Mm -hmm. they just kind of have this circle of money of billions and trillions of dollars flowing into one another that it's like, well, again, if it's not affecting me directly, why would I change it? Oh, you, um, I actually was on a, uh, a zoom call with some friends. We were doing a birthday zoom and one of our friends, uh, was talking about, you know, with the whole COVID situation that we've just become a society of true individualism. Like, we it's every man for themselves there's no societal consciousness anymore we we've completely strayed from the cultural norm of tribe and village and everybody pitches in to ensure the health and survival of the tribe and village that it truly is hurting us because nobody's unified in any direction at this point we're so siloed in so many smaller groups and we don't know how to deal with those who don't have the same perspective as us So, of course, everybody's going to branch out and do their own thing. And, of course, you're still going to have so much money pouring into the wrong areas because it's like not my problem, you know, and and that's that's the unfortunate part. And that's the thing. It's like, no, 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 no. It truly is your problem, because if all of us are, you know, I'll go the Joe route, fat, sick and nearly dead. Like nobody's there to make sure that you're actually okay. Exactly. You know, so we are all connected, whether you understand it or not, we're all connected regardless Mm -hmm. you said that honestly to a t could not have could not have said that any better myself and especially given medication and just how that whole world works you articulated that so well because I agree with you 100% and I think in kind of the alternative and functional medicine world it's not articulated enough at how Mm -hmm. 
how medicine and is so necessary in certain situations. Yeah. But it shouldn't be lifelong. It can save you when you need it. And in certain cases, in many cases, you need it. Like you need it right then and there. You don't have very many hours or days left or whatever right. it may be, but it is getting back to that root cause. And then just as a society, as a society, like back to that root cause, why do we sit where we sit today? I mean, right mm-hmm. down here in Florida yesterday in the Orlando area, there was a protest of people protesting against the requirement to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. And instead of just the, I mean, you and I, we've seen it online this last week in a certain group, instead of, we each hold individual opinions, but instead Mm -hmm. of coming together with love and trying to educate each other about why we feel and see so differently and where we've received those dialogues from, it comes Mm -hmm. as attacks to one another. And the emotions mm-hmm. come out and we just start spiking words and feelings and thinking like in Orlando, people were walking around with signs that said, my body, my life, mm-hmm. which is talks goes back against the women's rights movement and abortion and everything. Ooh, like that, I, listen, I was about to say like, where are you for that movement? But okay. Exactly. So <laughs> yeah, why you are even, why you even think it's okay to use that phrase when you're talking about wearing a mask is one thing. Um, and then also they were using, I can't remember, I'm trying to imagine, remember the exact image that I saw of this sign, but it was, I can't breathe, which is George Floyd's statement. But it was, mm-hmm. I can't breathe with a mask and something underneath of it, like, I can't breathe with this mask on. Mm-hmm. Which, again, you know exactly where you got those words from. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I could. So I almost like I almost started crying this morning when I saw it. It was like stomach hit the ground. What is wrong with yeah. people? But, again, that's not we're all trying to express our different opinions and views and just going about it in the wrong way. Like it's not coming from a place of love and, Hey, I don't agree with you, but let me hear you. Let me see you now. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to hear me? And let's figure out how we can mesh this. You know why that is? It's because nobody, not nobody, but there is not enough people paying attention to how do we have uh, conversations? I really appreciate uh, philosophers. Um, because I feel like in history, philosophers were the people, especially like deep in like the, the Renaissance kind of movement and, you know, the whole Greek mythology kind of era, if you will, where all of these really brilliant minds kind of came forth because they were willing to stop, absorb everything that's going around them and ask why, even in the face of an enemy. Okay. But why are we fighting over this lady again? Can somebody help me understand that? Like they were willing to sit here and and challenge the minds of higher levels of thinking, of outside thinking, of staying off of this one track lane of this is a collective. This is how we do things. We can't ever change. And we have to be able to change. I think there's there's nothing wrong with change. It's how we learn and adapt to our environments. We wouldn't be anywhere near this place if we stayed doing the same things that we're always doing. We always need change, right? But even more so, we need the art of conversation. It is something we need to be taught from day one. But we're putting the onus on families and, uh, you know, smaller communities and societies to teach people how to communicate. And I'll tell you right now, the only communication skills that I was taught is be articulate because white people won't take you seriously if you're not articulate. To navigate these kind of spaces versus learn to communicate and respect other opinions and have a dialogue about those differing opinions, not asking you to change yours, but learn to have a dialogue. And people can't do that. And yes, you're absolutely right. We're seeing it in a lot of these bigger groups um, that it's such an emotional time right now. And people don't know how to process and express emotion without projecting and attacking people because they were never taught that. And so everybody's on the defense because they don't know the difference between I'm sharing perspective and my feelings versus I'm telling you what you should think and feel. And people are confusing the two all the time, all the time. I see it all day long. And I'm like, 
<laughs> they're not, you know, I, I had a, a situation at a previous job where I was training someone and they're like, you know, it's, it's a lot of phone work. I, my background is in uh, uh, customer support. And so I, I teach people how to talk on the phone and, and do their jobs essentially. And so I had, you know, one girl say, she's like, you know, I just don't get why they're talking to me this way. It's like, it's so much verbal abuse. And I'm like, no, you're, you're mistaking frustration for verbal abuse because people need to vent. People don't know how to vent properly and in the right spaces. And when they're caught in a moment where you have no clue what their day was like, you just might catch it. And it's no fault of yours. You were just the one who answered the phone. But you have to be able to step outside of yourself because it's not about you. It is about, I have had all of this chain reaction events happen and now you're giving me more bad news and you're just the person who's providing it. You know, the whole don't shoot the messenger thing is so (laughs) real right now in our society because nobody wants to listen and understand how to have a conversation that expresses emotion without projecting it on other people and saying, this is what you're doing. Um, There's a difference between what someone literally says and the messes that you receive. I deal with this with my partner all the time. I'm very much an imaginative person. So when he says stuff to me, it's very, very literal. And I struggle to like, be like, okay, he's not saying I'm fat. He's not saying this. He's not saying that because that's the stories I'm telling myself in my head. And that's what I lead with now in conversations. I'm like, the story I'm telling myself in my head is this, but you literally just said this and that's what you meant, right? Like I'm clarifying because those are the things in my head that I need to work on. And I can't go off on him because I just had the little devil on my shoulder. Be like, nah, girl, he telling you, you don't look good in that. <laughs> this, you know what I mean? this whole three chapter story now. <laughs> right. Right. You know? And so, although it's great in a creative sense, if I want to like let loose on a painting or something, but not in a relationship where I need to communicate with him because now I'm going off on stuff and he's like, what the fuck did I do? I didn't do anything. I'm just sitting here. You know, I just literally said this. And that's where we end up. And so multiply that times millions and billions of people. Of course we are where we are today. Nobody knows how to talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. Communication. And we live in a world with texting and email. And then we're now trying to decipher what people mean through their words and through what they're typing and keyboard warriors and all of that. Ooh, ooh, keyboard warriors. I've never heard of that. Oh, I'm, I'm still in that. Keyboard warriors. Yes. Oh my God. So much. Yes. I know you know a lot. <laughs> Lord, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's, it's just, um, I just kind of feel like we are in a place where we have so much time and access to really check in on ourselves and like really understand what is the core place that I'm coming from. And, um, you know, I'm really sad that, um, I shunned therapy so long uh, because I had a real bad run in when I was a kid. You know, my parents meant well, but it just like was very off putting for me. So I was just like, therapists suck. And I'm not saying that there aren't some out there that are just completely ruining it for people. Don't get me wrong. Um, Just um, your situation at that time of your life. Yeah, yeah. It was just, it was just bad. But I'm so glad I gave it another shot because it has been so eye opening. And um, we kind of, I feel like everybody, if, if nobody is checking you on something, I feel like something's wrong. 100%. You know what I mean? If nobody's calling me out, I'm like, Taylor, you need to kind of sit back and rethink this and how you're operating this, you know? And we're so scared and so fearful of retaliation because um, we're not sure how somebody's going to take something, but we're not conditioning people to be used to that either. But we want to say, you know, are you willing to give me some feedback? Please give me some feedback. Do you really want feedback or you really just want affirmation that you're doing something right? You don't want to actually hear what's wrong. Mm Mm-hmm. You want a pat on the back or you want all that red ink on your paper? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. And then be mad at me because you this is exactly what you asked for and you don't want to put in the work to, to correct whatever it is because you feel like what your, what your actual stance is, is right. And you don't want to check with experts. That's another thing that really, really, really just annoys me. And especially I'm, cl- I'm close friends with a respiratory therapist who's been on the front lines with this COVID situation. And I'm watching her battle people all the time about it. And I'm like, guys, why did we make doctors and lawyers and these type of trades high paying? You need to go through so many years of school before I can deem listening to you. It is not that doctors won't have different opinions. That's because they're pursuing science in a different angle. However, I am not going to ask other people, what should I do about a very, very medical situation? I'm going to go talk to my doctor first. 
And then if I do need a second opinion, do that to another doctor or someone who's deeply trained in whatever. I am not ever claiming on anything that I'm doing to be a doctor. I'm not a medical professional. It is my experience. I'm sharing it. I'm saying this could potentially help, but you will always, always, always need to start with a professional who does this every day. I don't get that. Why am I going to tell a medical professional that they're wrong, that you're making this shit up and you're looking at it every day? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Suddenly everybody's got degrees. Let's call everybody doctors and nurses and shit now. Everyone's an expert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Until, until shit hits the fan and I'm like, I thought you wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> Within that, with your whole journey in the medical world, speaking of communication and everything that you've been through, whether it's black skin, brown skin, I know we had chatted a little bit before, just kind of the miscommunication that can also take place in the medical world in terms of Mm -hmm. trying to advocate for yourself and your own health in a predominantly white doctor world, not only are you, you know, maybe more highly susceptible and everything like that to your disease, but then you also are kind of climbing this uphill battle in trying to express yourself and your symptoms and what you're actually dealing with. So what has that been like for you? Yeah, it's, um, it's a lot packed into one. There's a lot of history with it too. Um, and I don't have the exact uh, names at the top of my head, uh, but I'm happy to go find uh, the articles and things that I've, I've read through um, and share it later. But essentially, I can link them in the show notes if you want to send them to me. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it started with a, uh, I don't know if he was like a genealogist or, or there was a, some, some scientist essentially who was doing testing on genetics, um, especially through different races and things like that on their ability to handle, you know, different experiments, things like that. So that way moving forward, um, you know, he actually came out with this whole, it's not a bad idea, but it's essentially like it's on the the benefit of uh, black women. So, so essentially he came out with this whole, you know, thesis saying that black, the black woman was essentially stronger and could handle more pain and could tolerate a lot more than the average white woman or Hispanic woman or Asian woman. A known scientist put this out there and it's it, it's 100% false. And so he capitalizes on this theory, right? And so um, it, it starts this chain reaction in the medical world of here's a profound name, which is why, yes, I do agree that we should, we should challenge the professionals that we have in place, but we can't completely discredit the knowledge and things that they've built up. I think we need to find someone of equal caliber to challenge them um, in order for them to do the science and the digging to um, actually ensure that what they're saying is valid. Um, So now you have this chain reaction in the medical world where, you know, if a black woman steps into uh, someone's medical care, me saying, I'm I'm in pain, this hurts. No, no, it's not. You can take it. It's okay. Just a little bit longer, right? How often do we say that a lot of times in, in, in anything, whether you're black or white or whatever, it's okay, just a little bit longer, hang in there, whatever. Oh, this really hurts. This really hurts. And I do understand it's like a... Sorry, even male versus female too. Like, oh, men have higher yeah. tolerances than women. Right, right. And not to say that some of those things don't make sense, you know, just for the, the um, anatomy of things. But even so, everybody's sensitivity level is different. So if I say, hey, this hurts, I would rather you say scale of one to 10, because I feel like that's going to give you an idea of the severity of how bad this is, because especially if I'm also having to stay very still. Yes, I'm already taking on the labor of I am fighting, kicking you in the fucking face right now <laughs> because this hurts so bad. And you're not going to listen to me when I say this hurts really, really bad, you know. And so it's, it's just run over into our whole system of a lot of times black women are not um, taken seriously when we are in um, the medical care of mostly white professionals. And it's just like, why is that? Why is it that if you and I were both uh, in in an uh, ICU right now and you and I were right next to each other, right? And let's say this whole movement hadn't really just come to light. If you're saying we're being treated for the same things and you're saying, I'm in pain, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. There's not enough morphine in this button. Help, like this, something is wrong. They are rushing to you. They are rushing to you and they are attending to you because when they, they see this is one of ours, 
we got to make sure that she's okay. In a, in, a, in a sense, they're almost subconscious saying, oh, you're also more fragile, right? Because I could be doing the exact same thing next to you. And they're like, okay, eh, we need to get to her first, actually. You'll be okay. You can take it. It's okay. Hang in there a little bit longer. I don't get what makes us different in that space. We're both dealing with the same thing. You need to have enough staff to help us both. Don't make me wait because if we're dealing with the same thing and you know time can determine how bad something comes up, you getting treatment first means I'm higher at risk for that treatment to fail. Another thing that I'll, I'll share with you that you can link into it, there was um, uh, pregnancy is huge in, in the black community and, and it affects us so heavily more than it does a lot of other, you know, um, uh, cultures, and nationalities. Um, there was a poor man uh, a couple years ago who was like suing the, um, the hospital in the city that's like funding it essentially because after his wife had given birth, she died. And so, you know, she had a complicated birth already. And then she's still in ICU trying to recover. And he's noticing things are just not right with her. Her coloring looks really bad. Like, you know, she's, she's having trouble speaking, all these things. And he keeps asking her, hey, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Please check on her. No, she'll be fine. You know, I'll, I'll let somebody know. We'll have somebody swing by to check on her, you know, in about an hour or so. He repeats this process several times until she has, I want to say it was internal bleeding and hemorrhaging. And they attempted to go back in way too late. They were literally rushing to do it at that point. And she ended up passing. And his whole argument is like, I was telling you guys all day long that something is not right. And you could have taken two minutes to check. And it's not to say that hospitals and, and, and hospital staff don't have weight on them. Obviously, you are literally cutting people open. You're literally put, drawing blood. You're doing a lot that I'm just not willing to do. I understand. However, if somebody says something's not right, can you just look and not do the dismissive oh yeah let me check you know let me look at the chart and be like all right she should be fine look and just alert somebody that's the thing that I just find so frustrating in the medical system it's like nobody is willing to go the extra mile the extra step of pay attention that's what we pay you for is hey and I totally get it I see it in customer service all the time where people are just raising hell for no reason and it's just because they don't understand and so even if you were to step in and say Here's what I'm seeing. This is normal. This is normal. You're right. This part is not. Let me go see something about it. Because we're not educated in that. And so sometimes that works to the disadvantage of those who are educated is you're you, you already assume that we don't know anything. And so because we don't know anything, that's why we're freaking the fuck out. Because you're not giving me reassurance with your knowledge that something is actually being done and that if I'm seeing this type of thing, I don't need to react. It could have very easily been if you see her turn this color or if you notice her blood pressure goes here, immediately hit this button. You know what I mean? Even just it arming him with something that could have helped him know like, OK, this is part is, is normal. It's a part of the process, that kind of thing. Like so or even just asking, well, what's going? OK, you're telling me something's wrong. What is it that you're seeing? How right. has she changed? Just ask one question. Right. And consider right. it. Yeah. Right. It's 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 a really, really sad thing. And, you know, it's it's frustrating because there's a lot of assumption with that, too. And I even feel it whenever I am, you know, uh, would go in for, um, you know, uh, gynecology appointments. Um, I have personally made it a point to have as many uh, uh, black or uh, people of color doctors as possible. My gynecologist is black. My primary is black. My dentist is black. Uh, I think the only person that isn't is my allergist and he cool. We already had a hard heart. So I, I, I'm gonna let him make him. <laughs> but that's that's why, because I know that you look like me. You understand you've gotten into this profession to some degree because nobody's paying attention to us. Right. So I would rather trust my hands with you than with anybody else because you'll listen to me. The first time that I got diet or that I tried to get checked for diabetes. Um, now he's also a man. So I'm a, there's a lot to unpack there too. But the doctor, he was a, a white passing Hispanic man. Right. And I told him, I said, you know, these are things that are happening to me. I do have a history of diabetes. I am concerned 
that I'm either pre-diabetic or, or that I'm encroaching that state, right? And the whole time that he's checking me, he is just monologuing the entire time. Completely monologuing the entire time. And I am just like, do you hear yourself, dude? Like, do you really hear what you're saying? And I'm trying to interject like, okay, but here's, and they're like, oh no, that's just, mm, he would just shut me down. And I'm just like, oh my God. So I immediately scheduled, you know, when I, when I was going to um, go back for my testing when I was fainting and had all the symptoms and stuff, I told the schedules like, do not, do not put me with that person. I need a female doctor, you know? And at the time I wasn't really heavily pursuing black doctors. I was just like, you know, I just need a female doctor at this point. I hope a woman will hear me because no, (laughs) you know what I mean? And then in recent years, that's when I pushed for um, more black doctors, one for just support in their income, but as well as just like, that's the only way that I'm going to feel um, kind of safely heard because I've just had too many instances where I have to sit there and be strong because that's, that's the black woman MO is you're angry, you're aggressive also, but you're really, really strong. You take on so much, you know, and even in, in being asked, like, do you have any kids? And, you know, is the, is, if you do have kids, is the partner around? I've had somebody ask me that. And I'm like, well, hey, no, I don't have any kids, but why do you need to know if the partner's around or what's up with that at all? Like, this is a, this is what, what you got to do with it. You know what I mean? And I'm like, oh, so you're assuming that I'm a single black mother. I grew up in a two parent household. Fun fact. Super shocker, right? You know, like it, it's something that's just like people expect that from me just from looking at me. Oh, messed up. Nah, nah. My only pain, my pain tolerance is because I got a lot of tattoos. That's it. <laughs> Outside of that, it's just like, uh, mm-mm, mm-mm. I can, I can take, get blood drawn, but I don't look at it. I'm just like, just keep it over there. Cause I, I'm, I'm going to get queasy. And I don't like, you know, like, don't, don't assume that, you know, let me tell you and use the scaling system. And, you know, with, with a lot of the movement that's happening, the thing that you're seeing with police brutality with black men is the thing that you see in the medical field for black women people don't listen to us a lot of the times. And it's so frustrating because, you know, um, I know we talked about this uh, a while back, but it's just like, if anybody should understand what I'm going through to some degree, it's other women. Yes. I feel like, especially white women, like, let's, let's not mistake. The women's suffrage movement has been an issue for a minute. That entire patriarchal system has been shutting us down for a minute. I just get the added layer of being black. So I wasn't even considered a person at one point. Right. But now that I am, yay, I think like I should have been all along, but, well, but I've always been a person that's never changed. Right. You know what I mean? But at, at, from a white woman to a black woman, it's just like, you should kind of get why this shit sucks. And this is why I get frustrated. I'm like, when I see other women who are supporting a lot of stuff that holds us down, have your choices. Absolutely. But don't tell me what mine should be, because we've been told our entire history of what we're allowed to do, what we're allowed to say, how we're supposed to dress. And I find it very funny, the just contradiction of men and their involvement in our lives of like, you should dress very modest. But when it comes to sexy time, I should be just this erotic, super sexual goddess. I mean, I'm not saying that I'm not, don't get me wrong, but (laughs) That's on my time. That's on me. That's because I want to do that shit. Not because you're demanding that of me, even though I'm supposed to be, you know, lady in the streets type shit. That's not for you to call out. Not your place. It's fitting you know into I mean? these preconceived boxes of, mm-hmm. well, in this situation, I'm comfortable if you're like this. But in this situation, mm-hmm. I'd be more comfortable if you're like this. And that's so mm-hmm. unfair. I mean, it takes the you know, the choice right out of it. Yeah, it makes no sense. And I completely agree with you there with this movement and everything that's going on, I try to understand, I always try to understand the shoes that someone else is in, the seat you're in, et cetera, et cetera. But for Mm -hmm. women, my tolerance level has gotten so low if you Mm -hmm. are not on the same page right now. Because like you said, we know, we know what it's like, or like, you know how it feels to feel uncomfortable to have not been taken seriously before and are witnessing it in the workplace probably, or just in certain, I mean, even in the medical world as well, you know, Mm -hmm. females are dramatic or Mm -hmm. 
whatever dialogues want to come along with that that is so so incorrect but yeah it's one thing for the men but for a woman you have no excuses right now at all yeah you see it all the time you know if you're a natural blonde what do people think if you're a natural brunette what, what do people think you know if if you've got a very curvaceous body like on what do, like you know and, and that's the thing it's like I know you will never understand what it is like to be black and come across these systems, but you do have a taste of it in that there are other areas that you're being oppressed and challenged on that are just as similar as, as the black plight of, I just step out and I'm, it's assumed already, right? And so it's just like, think about those moments where you were judged for being a blonde, where you were judged for what, you know, the skirt that you're wearing. Where you're being, it's the same thing except for They've built it into the system where my skin is a problem. Wow. Gotta love Taylor, right? She is truly the best. She's so awesome. But anyway, definitely stick around for part two so you can see where this story kind of leads to. We will jump into a whole handful of other topics, um, all just so eloquently spoken and kind of gives a little bit of a pers- perspective shift from Taylor that I love so much. She just kind of, she makes you think or she brings up topics that we don't normally talk about. So it's great. But as always, thank you so much for joining us here today. I am forever grateful for you all for tuning in. If you do feel called to do so, please feel free to leave a rating and review. It's the best way for us to really grow the podcast and in exchange, just get more ears listening to the stories from our wonderful guests, creating all different senses of connection and inspiration throughout our world. And we all need more of that right now. But if you do decide to leave a rating and review, definitely email me proof at lovingyourownsoul at gmail.com. And in exchange, I will send you my plant-based recipe ebook, which is filled with 25 wonderful plant-based recipes from smoothies, bowls, lunches, salad dressings, desserts. There's a whole bunch in there. So all you have to do is simply rate and review the podcast, screenshot it, screenshot for proof, and then send me an email to lovingyourownsoul at gmail.com. And I will, in exchange, give you my plant-based recipe ebook. So thank you again for being here and I look forward to catching up with you all on part two of Taylor's episode. Mm-hmm.